Hello and welcome to Coronanomics, brought to you by Econ Films. This week, the pandemic and technology. Through lockdowns, digital technologies have enabled us to keep in touch with families and friends, to work and shop and be entertained remotely. The share prices of the big US tech firms have duly soared. But what does this mean for the rest of us? Does it signal a bright future of higher productivity or a dystopia of monopoly power and spiralling inequality? And what of the citizens' privacy in an age of COVID tracking apps designed by Apple and Google? Has the pandemic accelerated the rise of a surveillance capitalism? I'm Ben Chu, economics editor of The Independent. And I'm Lizzie Verdon, economics reporter at The Telegraph. We'll be your guides, and if you like what we're doing, please hit the subscribe button as it helps people find us. Joining us this week is Brad DeLong, professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He was previously Deputy Assistant US Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration. We're also joined by Scott Galloway, who teaches brand strategy and digital marketing to MBA students at NYU Stern. Scott hosts the world's second and third best podcasts after Coronanomics, The Prof G Show and Pivot. He's also the founder of several firms and authored The Four, which tells the story of how Apple, Amazon, Facebook and Google became four of the most influential companies on earth. Welcome professors to Coronanomics. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as we mentioned in the introduction, the share price of the so-called FANGS stocks, that's companies like Facebook, Amazon, Netflix and Google and other tech firms as well, have soared this year, far outstripping the rest of the market, as you can see from this chart that we're showing. And that likely reflects a market judgment on their ability to prosper in a post-COVID world. Brad DeLong, first of all, when you look at that chart, and think about what it implies for the future dominance of those firms. How does it make you feel? Is it encouraged or worried? Um, I would say more awestruck and both encouraged um, and quite distressed. Um, distressed because those companies do not employ all that many people. And that we used to say back when we had coding. Um, the technological dominance of Kodak in manufacturing brought middle-class prosperity to Rochester, New York, and huge numbers of relatively high-paying jobs for an awful lot of engineers. By contrast, the fangs bring super fortunes to a few and fortunes to a many. Jobs, relatively low-paced manufacturing jobs by Global North standards, to other people around the world, but no broad-based tranche of relatively high-paying middle and upper middle-class jobs here on the global world. Let me move on to you, Scott Galloway. You warned about the uh, monopoly power of these tech giants before the pandemic struck, and that concern will presumably have grown on your part this year. Do you think that the new US administration of Joe Biden will have the courage to take them on and to actually cut them down to size? I hope so. They've attempted to use Corona as sort of a, an act of redemption and the labeling and attempt to cauterize misinformation around COVID-19 is a change in behavior. And that would signal that they see the writing on the wall. The analogy I would use is that you've had your high school students and you've had the mother of all rage your parties on a Saturday night and Sunday morning you get a text message from your parents saying they're coming home early and so you start cleaning up the house. Uh, it appears these companies are worried about a new administration and they are trying to clean up their act. It's probably too little too late but to Professor DeLong's uh, comments. You not only have economic inequality here, you have market inequality. If you look at the rip back in the NASDAQ in the United States, Somewhere between 70 and 90% of the recovery has been represented by seven stocks. If you ask people how their portfolio is doing, it's pretty simple. Do you own the four and Microsoft or, or uh, Moderna or Salesforce? So we not only have income inequality, we have market inequality. This is not a healthy ecosystem. Mm. And let me go back to you, Brad, because you were talking about the implications for inequality. What should be the policy response to that that you would advocate that Joe Biden follow? Is it all about antitrust or are there other um, measures that he should be looking at as well? Yes, they're huge. Yes, they're going to get huger. 
there are very sound reasons for them to be huge because they have massive network economy efficiencies. Um, they need to be properly regulated and controlled and tamed so that we manage to grab onto all the economies of scale and networkness without allowing them to use the enormous market power to increase margins that we have. It's going to be very much a world in which the public sector has to control large dominant companies on a case by case basis, rather than relying on market competition to keep them all behaving right. That will be a very different world from Adam Smith's world, and it'll be a world in which it'll be easy for the government to get it wrong. I want to talk now about the impact of all of this on privacy. Um, there's an argument that countries with more authoritarian regimes like Singapore and China have dealt with the pandemic better in some cases because of their willingness to encroach on the privacy of their populations with surveillance technologies. Here are people in China being told to return home by drones. Um, Scott, when that kind of approach seems successful, does it make it harder for people in the West to, who are concerned about privacy to argue their case? I'm not sure I buy into the premise of the question. I think the notion that the, the especially nations in Asia who have had in Taiwan, I think they've had 60 deaths in a nation of 20 million people. We've had just 26 or 28,000 deaths in New York. And we say, well, it's because they're autocratic. It's much easier to contain a virus when you have um, you know, a lack of civil liberties. I, I think that's a narrative we tell ourselves to try and wallpaper over the fact that the United States and the United Kingdom have demonstrated a level of incompetence and negligence that is just staggering. And they talk about, they say, well, it's not fair to compare us to these, some of these nations such as South Korea or Taiwan, because, and the word they use is compliant, which in my view is thinly veiled faux exceptionalism. I, we were compliant in World War II when there was a rubber shortage. We had a self-imposed speed limit of 30 miles an hour. We didn't have our hand out waiting for government stimulus. We converted machine washing factories into factories to build Bradley tanks and super fortresses. I just don't think there's any getting around it. With 5% of the world's population and 25% of the deaths and infections, I think Americans have to take a hard look in the mirror and ask how a country that spends more on healthcare, a country that prides itself on being an innovator, a country that likes to think that we're empathetic and, and, and takes care of our populace, how we could have gotten this so wrong. So we turn to this narrative of, oh, it's our freedom and our liberty. It's not, you're not expressing freedom and liberty when you refuse to wear a mask to Walmart. This is, this is an attempt to wallpaper over what I believe has just been an absolutely incompetent response to the virus. Do you agree with that, Brad? Your libertarian freedom was never supposed to include that you did do your freedom to infect others with a potentially deadly disease. I remember being in China in the aftermath of SARS-1, um, going through airports and watching the airport security, all of them watching monitors tuned to the body temperature of the people moving through. And when someone came through the airport with a fever of 100 or more, they would glow red on the screens. And very nice and polite people would come and say, do you know you have a fever? Um, let's take you off and get you tested and isolated because we don't want SARS. We could have started testing and tracing massively early. We could have taken people who we thought were infectious or about to become infectious and said, we're going to put you up at a hotel for two days. If you want to look at the countries that have done very well, it's not that some of them are compliant um, or culturally different or culturally other. Some of them saw SARS of 15 years ago up very close and personal and figured out what they were going to do the next time something SARS-like came along. Um, and so whether it's Australia, South Korea, all done very well, it's the rest of us who've had big problems. I mean, so we've talked about incompetence and um, incompetence with the technology, and you've mentioned track and trace. Um, Scott, the idea just a year ago of liberal democracies tracking the daily movements of their citizens would have seemed like some sort of Orwellian dystopia. Um, but actually, is it really any less data than many of the big tech firms have held on us for years? 
Um, and how much does it fundamentally matter whether this data is in state or private hands? Privacy is a, it gets a lot of attention in the media, but if you look at actual consumer behavior, consumers uh, love to have their privacy violated as long as there's a coupon or some sort of utility at the end of it, and they don't feel like their privacy is being, or their data is being used for you know, tracking data on sexual orientation or religious or political beliefs. But if you wanna see how much privacy you have, get on a cell phone and start talking about detonating a dirty bomb in Times Square, and you're gonna see how much privacy you have. Uh, and I, I actually don't believe these companies are malicious themselves. The dangerous thing is that these companies don't want to make the requisite investments that would result in a decline in their profitability to ensure that their platforms are weaponized by bad actors. So when the foreign intelligence arm of the Russian government decides to start pouring fuel on incendiary or false content that undermines our electoral process, uh, Facebook puts its hands over its ears and eyes and doesn't want to hear about it because it gets in the way of their business model. So you know, look at this action, right? This is where I am, and then I get an Uber and people know where you're going. A little, a, a limited amount of AI above those traffic trends and where you're taking photos could tell a lot about you. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion that consumers are increasingly uncomfortable that their data might be used to do things like pervert our democracy. I think we're increasingly thinking about privacy, but there's some consumer dissonance. Consumers seem to like their privacy violated. I'm sure I read that you said that Mark Zuckerberg was the dangerous, most dangerous man on earth. I mean, do voters object more when governments have their data than when consumers' um, data is with companies? The key is, what, what are the people who are collecting my data going to use it for? As long as it's a company that wants to sell me things that I will like and make me aware the market opportunities I did not know before, that's absolutely fine. Even if it does lead to great weirdnesses, like my wife bought two bras on my account some two months ago, and now brazier advertisements follow me around the internet um, to extraordinary numbers of places that I would not have thought were linked by any conceivable network of advertising networks. And then there are the people who, um want to scare the shit out of me so that my eyeballs are glued to the screen so they can sell me overpriced gold funds and fake diabetes cures. And third, there are the people who genuinely want to hack my brain, um, not so much to exploit me in buying overpriced gold funds, but rather to do larger scale things to our society as a well. whole. And, you know, we love the first. Uh, we want the first to know as much about us as possible so that they don't waste our time trying to sell us things we don't want. And we are very much annoyed and fear the second because they do not have our interests in heart. And we really should be terrified mm. at the third. Mm. Um, I want to talk now about the future. Um, a lot of people have said that this pandemic is bringing the future forward. It's accelerated trends towards technologies such as e-learning. And we've got a picture here of a Harvard Business School professor demonstrating a high-tech online classroom. There have also been innovations in areas like e-commerce. Scott, is all this digital innovation a good thing? You know, even if virtual classrooms widen access to education, might we also see overall inequalities rise if the richest students continue to attend bricks and mortar institutions? I take some pride that you have an all Cal Berkeley uh, panel here. <laughs> to date, the <laughs> University of California has been an incredible upward lubricant for middle class uh, mobility. And unfortunately, public school tuition has increased 1400%. And we haven't been able to expand our enrollment. So what we end up with is either two cohorts, the children of rich people that can get their kids into the testing industrial complex or have contacts that have put their have their name on the side of a building, or what I call freakishly remarkable 15 and 16 year olds that build wells and have patents by the time they're seniors in high school. So technology, technically, if you take 50% of your classes online, you can technically double the supply. And we might be able to go from where we are now, where there's a 12% admittance rate to my undergraduate institution, UCLA, to back to where it was when I got in. And that was a 60% admittance rate. So the son of a single immigrant mother who lived and died a secretary who was not remarkable, and I'm not, that's not a humble brag, I wasn't remarkable, 
has a shot at a remarkable future. So I'd like to think the technology, the crisis, putting universities to their feet to the same flames that middle class households and businesses have to face such that they think about new ways to expand supply, dramatically increase freshman seats. Our neighbor to the south, uh, Brad and I, Stanford University has tripled the number of applications and they've decided not to increase their freshman seats one person because academics, and I'm guilty of this, we become drunk on luxury. We no longer see ourselves as public servants, but as luxury brands. We need to move back to a notion that education isn't about turning the top 1% into billionaires. It's about taking the other 99% and giving them an opportunity to have remarkable futures. We need to use technology to dramatically expand the enrollments and the admittance rates at our public universities. So I'm quite hopeful that technology can play a big role post-corona in returning higher ed to its rightful place as the greatest upward lubricant of income mobility in the history of the West. Mm. We definitely need to fix educational opportunity. I'm not sure that this is the kind of shock that is going to do it because we turn out not to be very good at all at teaching online, at least not so far. Brad, I want to turn now to uh, the sort of the macroeconomic impacts of this crisis. So we've seen how lots of firms have been forced to invest in things like cashless payments, giving their workers laptops, selling more online. Might we look back at this crisis in the end as a positive shock to our productivity? Is that possible, do you think? One chance in four, we're going to look back afterwards and find we've saved massively in commuting and congestion costs, and that we've managed to improve our online information systems massively, and we really don't miss the death of retail very much. Um, because we are seeing, I think, the death of retail. Uh, that it's not just restaurants, with restaurant waiters being replaced by home delivery drivers. Um, we're seeing, will it be good? It depends on whether we are smart enough to find other better, higher value things for the people who used to work at those jobs to do once we figure out that we really no longer need the retail establishments that we had before. Will we do that? Well, we have no chance of doing that unless we manage to keep employment high. Because when unemployment is high, when employment is low, Nobody knows where the opportunities are going to be, so they sit on their hands. It's only when there are clear opportunities to make lots of money to hire people that people get pulled out of employment and pulled out of low productivity and low value jobs into higher product, the higher productivity, higher value jobs in yeah. the future. I mean, let me bring in Scott. I mean, do you agree with Brad on that? There's a sort of one in chan four chance that this will be a positive long term sh uh, shock for the for the global and American economy. What are your thoughts on the sort of the macro impacts of this crisis we're all living through? Well, it remains to be seen. I mean, I mean, if the ultimate example of COVID being more of an accelerant than a change agent, if you look at the percentage of transactions that are digital in nature as a as a ratio of retail, in March, we were sitting at 18% of all retail was, was transacted through digital channels. In eight weeks, it went to 28%. We were growing 1% a year, so we had 10 weeks we had a decade of acceleration of e-commerce in just eight weeks. Mm. Uh, it depends what you mean by retail. Smaller retails are going to get absolutely crushed. The bigger retailers, Walmart and Amazon, have added more value than all of European retail combined in the last six months. So there's some big winners here. If you think about retail, it depends what you mean. So Panera Bread, which is a 2000 outlet restaurant chain, now 60% of their sales are through e-commerce. And while we'll lose a lot of square footage of what we think of as traditional retail, the JCPenney's and the Sears of the world, we're gonna gain a lot of warehouse space. So retail, there's some very unhealthy things in retail that kind of uh, mimic the larger economy. We have a K-shaped recovery. Amazon is up 600% in the last five years. Walmart has probably doubled, and, the, and there's some, uh, some high flyers we talk about, whether it's Lululemon that have done pretty well. I'm on the board of a company called Urban Outfitters that has done okay. Rumors of retail's death have been greatly exaggerated. It's just entirely reshaping. You're going to see uh, 12 years of e-commerce acceleration in grocery. We're going to go from 2% of sales to 20% in the U.S. So that's $150 billion going from the traditional grocer to online grocer, which will have huge implications, whether it's cold storage or supply chain or refrigerated trucks. 
So retail is reshaping, though unfortunately it mimics the rest of our economy. Bigger and bigger winners, more and more spoils across fewer and fewer players. I would have thought that the loss of much so direct, immediate, personal social contact to urban outfitters would have been absolutely devastating. Urban Outfitters does over 50% of its business now via e-commerce. So think of the 550 stores is these really well-lit, well-staffed warehouses that serve as distribution centers. And there is some socialization there. What you have with specialty retail and you have in general is one of the biggest mistakes we make in marketing is believing that choice is a good thing. Consumers want less choice. They just want to be more confident in the choices presented. Brad, I don't know if you know Dominic Cummings, who is the chief advisor to our prime minister, Boris Johnson, says that there are trillion dollar bills being left on the ground by the UK not developing its own versions of Silicon Valley giants, that government funding and research and development can enable us to have these kind of uh, leading edge companies in the UK. And he thinks we should spend a lot of money on trying to build another giant like that. Is that a mad idea? What are your what's your reaction to hearing that? It seems it's absolutely mad. There were opportunities for Britain to do that, um, but they were opportunities for Britain to do that as a country that was very tightly integrated into the economies of continental Europe, you know, and that London as providing a unique place to bridge across the Atlantic, um, a place where you could produce and deal both serving the European continent and also having the language and communication links across the Atlantic. And so potentially if you were located in London, you could serve two continent sized markets rather than one. Now, it looks very much as though the current government is headed for a Britain that will serve zero um, continents. And if you're serving zero continents, you can't have such giant firms serving an island of only how many, 60 million people yeah, now? Yeah, 67, yeah. Especially since there's what, now going to be a customs border in the Irish Sea, plus there's going to be an underwater flooded lorry park in Kent. But but Scott, I mean, just very finally now, it, could you see a Google, an Amazon, something like that coming out of the UK? Or is it just impossible for anyone to produce these kind of giants apart from the US because of scale, as Brad says? Oh, sure. The innovation is alive and well outside of uh, uh, the United States. It's called China. And <laughs> I mean, there's Brad's probably right. It's probably too late, but we like to think uh, we have a self-serving narrative here in the U.S. that you want free trade and you don't want to put up artificial barriers. But if you look at what China's done, China's basically let American companies into the mainland long enough to steal their intellectual property and then prop up a local entrepreneur and they're remarkably innovative and then they've built their own national champions. Mm -hmm. And it's easy for us to disparage it, but three of the 10 most valuable companies in the world and probably the biggest IPO by a factor of 10 this year is gonna be a company called Ant Financial because they didn't want PayPal, they didn't want Amazon. And I think a lot of European nations are probably looking back in the rearview mirror and go, you know, the Chinese way seems to have worked pretty well for them. So I'm a big fan of free trade. It's, uh, but in Europe, I think they're saying, OK, we get all of the downside of big tech, the tax avoidance, the job destruction, the anti-competitive behavior, the weaponization of our elections. But we don't get as much of the upside as the U.S. There aren't that many hospital wings or university buildings with the names of Google or Facebook billionaires on the side of them. So in Europe, I think you've gotten a raw deal. You've gotten all of the downside with a fraction of the upside. I believe it's been a one-sided trade. I think Trump's one of Trump's few positive legacies coming out of this will be that he, <laughs> he, he decided to exit the Chinese-U.S. ecosystem. But I would argue that the European free trade, it hasn't worked well for, for Europe, quite frankly. The Obama administration had a plan for pressuring China on intellectual property. It was called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So that is, you established a common bargaining position with all of other China's major trading partners, and then you go to them for intellectual property negotiations as a unified front. Um, Trump blew up the Trans-Pacific Partnership on his day one without, as near as I can see, anyone in the Trump administration understanding what it's for, um, and then tried to fight a trade war with China. It's as if you go to a duel and your first act is to break your sword over your knee and then say, now I'm ready. Definitely don't blow up 
the weapons that you need to fight a trade war and then launch them. Trump is going to go down as a uniquely incompetent administration whenever people look at the policies, let alone when people look at the rhetoric. Well, we're, we're out of time. We've gone from China to Trump to Lululemon to technology to Amazon to you name it. It's been a fantastic uh, race through a huge amount of subjects and uh, a great, great discussion, as I said. So thanks so much again to Brad DeLong and for to Scott Galloway for appearing on Coronanomics. We'll be talking to many more top thinkers in the weeks ahead. So please do stay tuned and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember, if you like what we're doing, please hit like and subscribe. And if you'd like to talk to us, just leave us a comment below. This has been Coronanomics brought to you by Econ Films. <laughs> <laughs>